Hi, I'm Don Lombardi, and I'm here with my co-host and a very special guest. My co-host is in Japan. You know him. If you don't, I don't know where the heck you've been. Uh, he's in the Modern Drummer Hall of Fame. He's our DC artist in residence. And of course, for years, you've known him with Frank Zappa and Missing Persons. Terry Bozio is my special co-host, and our special guest continues to have a huge influence over generations of drummers, not just because of who he's played with, to mention a few, Carlos Santana, P-Funk, John Schofield, but because of his amazing technique, feel, and pocket. Yeah, I know you agree with that, Terry. Let's welcome Dennis. Dennis. Right on. How are Dennis. you doing? Hey, man. Hey, hey. We're, we're all over the world, by the way, people. We've got Terry in Japan. Dennis, where are you? You're at home? Baltimore. Yeah. Ba in Baltimore. Oh, so, yeah. you know, the magic of Zoom. Tell us, Terry, you know, when did you first meet Dennis? What was your experience when you first saw him playing? Well, I first saw him playing. I first heard him playing. I think I was before Missing Persons or something, right? And uh, just around 79 or, or 80. And uh, I heard a live broadcast of P-Funk. And I went, what? <laughs> you know, the drummer was just killing it. And uh, then I think I met him first time with, uh, when I was in with the Lonely Bears at a Frankfurt Jazz Festival and the Brecker brothers were on the night after we played uh, with the Lonely Bears. And so uh, Randy, somebody in the Brecker brothers said, look, get up on, the, on Dennis's drums. And when he walks in, go, okay, scum funk, and then count it off like I had replaced him or something. So at any rate, that's where we met and uh, we became friends. And, you know, man, I've been honored to have him come to my drum clinics. I'm like, oh God, you know, scary. And uh, I, I don't know, you know, he is an example of what I've come to, uh, to really think is, is what drumming is all about, which is some kind of deep, deep natural talent that just happens to some guys and not to say, that you don't practice or you didn't work your ass off. But, you know, after all that stuff, uh, there's something there that's just, that's what I want to hear. You know, that's what I want to hear. And that's the most important thing. And it really can't be taught. It's just, is there or it's not. So like Salieri, I look at him, Mozart, and just go, well, it ain't me. <laughs> you know, he's got it and I don't. And that's the way God meant for it to be. So, yeah, I love him. I don't and, see you know, he's, he's, very, he's, he's a very funny guy and a really nice guy, too. So don't let the, the way he drums scare you. <laughs> <laughs> you me kidding me, man. When I first saw Terry play with Frank Zappa, that scared the crap out of me, man. I, I'm not kidding. <laughs> uh, you know, it, the, the showmanship he, he had behind the drums and the, what he just hit the drums hard and it just grooved the music. Man, I, I just saw just pure fun and just, I mean, with all that technical music going going around, he just made it look so, he was just having a ball back there. Although he looked like, he looked like Animal from the Muppets <laughs> back there. With hair going, you know, and he's swinging and, you know, like spitting at the drums at the, you know, I'm like, Jesus. <laughs> and then you, then you meet him, he's all like, you know, like soft-spoken. How you doing? <laughs> I'm looking at him like, what the heck? <laughs> he can't be the same guy so behind the kit. No, but I, you know, I love him. I love him. I love you too, man. You know, like those days, Zappa, he had such a, a rigorous schedule, which is what, you know, we all need. Like eight hours a day of playing the damn drums and playing music. You know, that's that's kind of, you know, what it should be. And then you go out on the road and... uh you know, you, you sleep and get your rest and your food. And then, you know, you're kind of awake from sound check until after the show. Yeah. And then you go to sleep and you do it again. And, yeah. and that gives you this, it's like breathing or walking or anything else. You know, the, yeah. the music is just part of your life. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you have a confidence because uh, you do it all the time. You have a consistency because you do it all the time. And uh, it's like, I remember my friend when he moved to New York, met Jack DeJeanette and Jack said to him, uh, yeah, the music business has ruined my chops, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's like when it's, when it's like, oh, you know, do a session here and then, you know, this gig is there and, you know, you don't have that consistency. 
uh, it's, it's a whole different thing. But I, I credit, you know, Frank and his uh, work, work ethic and his uh, principles and stuff for, for all that. And, you know, George used to come all the time to see Frank and we would go see him in the combat zone and in uh, Boston or someplace, you know, and so there was some kind of connection between those two guys. I don't know what it was. And for a while we were auditioning uh, Glenn Goings and, uh, but he had to go back to, to, you know, Funkadelic. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, Glenn and Gary, Gary, Gary uh, Scheider, the guy uh, who I thought Ike Wallace kind of, Ike Wallace? Is that his name? Ike? Yeah. Yeah. Ike Wallace kind of copped his vibe or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Even had the same apple hat and everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but Gary, Gary Shadow and Glenn, they were both like terrorists. Both. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, plus the feel, you know, the pocket from their rhythm guitar, play, from Glenn's rhythm guitar playing was yeah. just, uh, you know, that's what you want to feel. That's what you want to play with. So, yeah, Glenn, Glenn and Gary kind of remind you of um, uh, Johnny, Johnny Guitar Watson, sort of. Mm -hmm. And Frank like, loved yeah. him. You know, one night Frank had, uh, before he died, he was sick, so he couldn't really play, but he would have all these guests over for a soiree, he called it. <laughs> and so, you know, on a Friday night, he had the Chieftains from Ireland, the Tuvans from Mongolia with that overtone singing, yeah. and Johnny Guitar Watson, and uh, Shankar was there, and uh, so many people. And at any rate, um, the... <laughs> Johnny Guitar walks in, right? You know, he's got his studs parked out outside. <laughs> and that's another story. I remember seeing back in the 70s, man, where cars were not this kind of money. You see this billboard for studs, $50,000, you know, and you're like, oh my God. And then I come off tour six weeks later and it's studs, $100,000. <laughs> so at any rate, Johnny Guitar drives up in that and comes in, you know, with his pimp hat and it just styling you know and the tuvan guys frank says uh, sing a little something for johnny <laughs> the tuvans do this you know and the you know the sound was like somebody whistling on top of their pedal tone you know and johnny just going what <laughs> and then you know frank asked johnny to to play and johnny goes over to the piano i think i had no idea and he was like all over the piano and he, he was playing Stella by Starlight, you know, and it was like, what? I, I had no wait a idea. Minute, wait got... a minute, Johnny Guitar playing good. He's playing piano. Yeah. And Stella I mean, Frank, had, yeah, Stella by Starlight. Oh. And he was all over the piano. I mean, it was a little showy, you know, compared to, say, Herbie or somebody. But he was making all the changes and doing all that stuff. And I was just like, I thought this was the guy who plays, you know, a couple of notes and, you know, you want to die on the guitar. And nope, that guy had some depth, man. I, I, I would like to see that. Things that we share, the, the both of us, the experience of being in a band, I mean, in a band that uh, you, you live together and the band, you feel like you're in a family. Yeah. You know? Now it's like, you know, there's not that many bands, uh, you know, today, you know, guys get together and they're, they're together for a month and then they break up, you know, or mm. something. But there's something about, you know, being in a band for, you know, like, you know, some years, at least two or three years, you know, and you're, you know, always around each other, you know, practically living on tour with each other. I mean, when I was with P-Funk, I, I, I think, let me say, I joined them in 70, 78, and left them in 80, 85 and still not sure if I really left because every time they, I mean, up until this pandemic or epidemic that we had, every time they came around, I would still go and, you know, set in and still, you know, play the crap, well, play the songs as best as I could. Mm. But yeah. the band had changed though, you know, the members, you know, some guys have died and. Yeah, that's the thing, you know, yeah. Frank is gone. A lot of, a lot of my favorites are gone. And what would you suggest that young kids work on now? I've always said, you know, like, you should always try to approach your playing towards music. Everything should be about, the gold is about playing music. And, you know, like, every, I, I notice, you know, um, a, lot of, a lot of guys today, everybody want to play chops. They want to learn how to, they want to learn how to run before they learn how to crawl. And they don't understand the crawling is the fun part. 
You know, that's yeah. that's the that's where you learn. You know, meaning that you know you have to you know start off simple and then work your way into all the the crazy things. You know, like learning time signatures and and um, and all that stuff. But you know, you gotta have you have to have a, a cake in order to put icing on. You know, chops is the icing. Playing the song is the cake. You know, and I don't I don't see that a lot. I, mm. I just see I go hear bands play and and you have drummers. Uh, back there, you know, trying to prove a point that they can play. And, you know, which kind of, you know, freaks me out a little bit because, you know, I, I hear a guy, you know, like somebody's trying to sing a song. And I hear a guy taking a solo back there when he should be just playing the song. And then, you know, like somewhere in the show, you get a chance to do what you need to do, but concentrating on concentrate on playing music. And, you know, some guys I, I, I see, uh, you know, they want to, they want to be the fastest drummer in the world. They're younger guys now. They want to be the fastest drummer in the world. And there's no such thing as the fastest drummer in the world. And it's not even that important to be the fastest drummer in the world. And I keep telling them, you know, I'll tell some guys, you know, um, you know, do you think for one minute that, uh, you know, Billy Cobham, Buddy Rich, and anybody who played fast, they made a living by just being fast? No, no matter who they are, they still have to play music. Buddy Rich played music, beautiful music. Billy Cobble played beautiful music. Terry Bozio played beautiful music. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you know, drummers play drummers. Drummers play music. You know, and you know all that. All that. You know, like I want to. You know, be the fastest. You know, man. Okay, you be the fastest, and you be sitting home. You know, like wondering how come your phone is not ringing. I'm 61, going on 62 years old, and my phone is ring, still ringing. Knock on some wood, wherever it is. Yeah. <laughs> now that's a, that's it's an important message for young kids out there, I think, and we talk about that a lot on the on the channel. You know, you don't. I don't know of anybody that's ever gotten a gig by somebody sitting down and saying, "Let me see your paradiddles. <laughs> how right. fast you can play." However, I have to tell you both, I did recently interview. The world's fastest drummer, and most people don't even know he's a drummer. Who's that? Who's that? Will Power. He won the Indianapolis 500, and he plays drums. <laughs> he's a race car driver. Uh, and he, he plays drums That's and great. came out, and we did an interview with him. So he, he qualifies in that category. Uh, and that actually is his I name, know. Will Power. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if you're into racing, you would, you would know him for sure. Your mentors, Dennis, that you would like younger kids to look up to, like we always trying to look at our people that came before us. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I really idolized Clyde Stubblefield from James Brown and Zigaboo Mona Lisa from the Meters. And, um, you know, that's from the funk world. And, and then uh, Al Jackson from uh, Stax Recordings hmm. and all the guys that played in the early Motown stuff, you know. I mean, because when I, I started playing drums in the 60s and that's what was on the radio, you know, a lot. So I, you know, went to that immediately, you know, trying to learn how to, you know, or try to, you know, try to play those records, play those songs, which landed, you know, me playing in nightclubs at the age of six, you know, as a novelty, <laughs> novelty drummer. You know? <laughs> you know, it was a lot of payola, you know, for, you know, the, the club owners to pay off the cops not to come in the club. Wow. But, you know, uh, nevertheless, that happened. And um, and then I found uh, jazz. I mean, actually, I found jazz earlier, but I didn't understand it. And I even saw Tony Williams once play with Miles. Uh, and it was around the, the Miles. Uh, no, yeah, it was the Miles Smiles record. I think they had just come. I think they had just released it or something. And Tony, the, the club owner, I used to play at this club. It was called the, the Peyton Place on Pennsylvania Avenue here. And uh, I went down, the, the, the owner was you know, telling me, you know, like, if you want to really see a drummer play, you need to come back here, blah, blah, blah. So some friends, you know, brought me back and I said, they've set me in a corner, you know, away from the door and away from everything so I can sit, you know, by myself or actually sit with a friend and watch. And Tony came on, man, and it sounded like, to me, it sounded like the cops were outside waiting for him, and this will be the last time he ever play in life. 
and not meaning that it was like just chops. It was so it was so beautiful. I mean, it sounded like it was the Tony Williams band featuring Miles Davis. That's what it sounded like. And he had so much freedom, and yet he didn't overplay anything, and he didn't underplay you know things. And I and it was so it was way over my head, you know, but it was so impressive that I couldn't even. I kid you not, I couldn't sleep for 48 hours. Cause you know, every time I closed my eyes, I just heard rhythms, these rhythms that I, you know, it was like, he, it was like hearing a, a, a alien speak for the first time. You're just trying to figure it out. And then once I figured it out, well, not really figured it out, but once I understood some form of jazz, then I was hooked. Then I went back and, you know, start studying, you know, like uh, listening to, Blakey and, and uh, uh, definitely Elvin. I saw Blakey. In fact, I opened for Blakey once. But, you know, studying Elvin and, and then Roy Hands, then going back, you know, just doing research. And that's another thing that, you know, like kids don't do today. They, they don't even research their freaking homework. So, you know, you know, they have to learn, you know, like if you're going to play music, you have to study, you know, like, you know, music. You have to study what came before, you know, the guy that you like. You know, we didn't have YouTube, Terry and I, and you know, guys of our generation, we didn't have it. We had our ears. We went out and bought records. We put the vinyl, we smelled the, you know, the, the album and it, you know, you know, put the album on and you read the back of the album cover, you know, like read the credits and you know, you you know, you, you learn things by doing that. Well, and and you know, for us, you know, if we heard something that we liked, we took the stylus off and we put it somewhere back where we thought where the, where the thing was. And if we went back too far, then now you're gonna sit there and wait for the thing to come back up again. And, and, and if you didn't catch it, then you pick the stylus up and put it back again. But this time you put quarters on it, on the, on the vinyl to slow it down. Well, see, you, you know, today they got YouTube. <laughs> and and, and there's, there shouldn't be any reason why anybody should be ignorant, you know, to music because if whoever you like on that screen, if you dare to take a look at the left of that screen or the right of that screen, I know I did it backwards here. If you went to the left of the screen <laughs> or the right of the screen, you see these little thumbnails of, of people. And if you dare to hit on it, you find yourself going into a wormhole of history. And you can find out exactly the drummer who you like or the musician that you like, you can find out exactly who and where they came from. But they won't do it. Mm-hmm. What, what do they, you think? They, got this, this, they, they, they look at this stuff and they, 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 they're, they're, um, they, they're looking at it from a, a horse standpoint, which is, you know, when the horse have blinders on, you know, you know, it's like just walking down the street and they, you know, they can't see anything from left to right. And, you know, they, they just put these blinders on for no reason. You know, if you're looking at YouTube and you look at the left or the right of that thing, man, and just click on it, you get your mind blown. If you listen by ear, you know, then you have, you know, then you start using your imagination. Once you find out what the setup is, except for Terry's, Terry's kit is is quite. Uh, <laughs> but still, it's kind of that imagination but, thing, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and that's the beauty about it, because I always tell people all the time is like, but you know, one thing about Terry, Terry would not put up something that he he um, he can't hear it. It's, if it's up there, he hears it, and be, you better believe he won't just, just play anything. He's playing it because he hears that. And that's the beauty of it. Instead mm-hmm. of having guys just having a lot of gear, and, you know, like, you guys got, like, three or four bass drums, and they got, like, one bass. I've been, I went to, I won't mention any names, but I went to a few rock concerts <laughs> where the guys got three bass drums, and one, one of the bass drums got a cooler. <laughs> it's got a cooler in it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> And the other bass drum is like, you know, he don't even dare to play it. You just play the, the right one, right side, you know. And, you know, but meanwhile, it looks good, but, you know, was he playing it? No, what Terry, is, it, it ain't just for looks. He's playing it. But, you know, when you listen to records and you listen to, like, you know, Big Sid or, you know, Elvin or, and you, you can pretty much, you know, you can hear the pitch of the drum so you can kind of figure out, like, what the setup is, sort of. So therefore, you know, if you when you're looking at it that way, 
you're using your imagination about what's going on on the, on the, on the, uh, when you when you play this piece. Mm. You know the way he plays a dotted eighth note on the right hand. You know what the left hand's doing. It's it's gonna it's making you think. Well, you two, you know, you don't have to think. It took the thinking out of it. You know, you just <laughs> oh, is that what? Oh, that's what it is. You know, I I can see the right hand moving. I can see the left hand moving. Well, I just do that, and I should be cool. <laughs> Dennis Let's just ahead, reminded Bob. me of something. Uh, and we're gonna <laughs> and we're gonna have to show it. I think it's I think it's confession time. I believe there was a moment in time when you actually snuck behind Terry's kit. We should take a quick look at that. If you remember <laughs> that, it was like a lot of holy shits. What is this? But we'll, we'll play we'll play a second of that. Well, we got you now. We got to show that one. All right, guys. I'm here, and Terry's not here, so I'm back. I'm gonna make a attempt to play this thing because I wouldn't do it in front of him. That's for sure. And you see the sign that says, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> wait a touch. Terry, if you ever see this, I'll kill you. <laughs>
sending that to you. <laughs> Nut job. <laughs> How long do it take you to, to put that kit together? It usually takes uh, all day. You know, we, if we arrive at, um, I don't know, say by one or two, uh, I'm helping and tweaking until five and then maybe have a, a bit of dinner and then we're on at seven. So, and that's with help, right? That's with help. Yeah. I mean, they do the heavy lifting and, and, uh, you know, there's usually guys at the club that'll help and my tech will direct, but then it's all brought in and I'm kind of tweaking as we build, you know, there's certain things he can do and I can not look at, but other things, you know, I feel a little insecure about it unless uh, unless I'm doing it myself. Right. I could so have sworn I, I saw I saw a drum clinic uh, at Gordon Miller's music store here, and it didn't seem like it took you that long to put that thing together. No, not in those days. But then you know that was pre rack and pre the giant kit that I've you know developed since I got with DW. You know, it's their guy's fault because they'll if I think of something they'll make it for me and then it's added on. And if you add on something every couple of weeks or so, you know, you're out of control soon. So I, I always say I've painted myself into a corner. <laughs> well, yeah, you're right. You're right. Because it was pre-DW. Uh, we then had to rent a bigger building. That, so the whole thing, like the kit got so it didn't fit in the room anymore. It was going through the false ceiling at the top. So moved him <laughs> down the street into a bigger building. So he's got a ways yeah. to grow now. What about your artwork, Terry? I've been doing characters stuff like that like like here's one you've heard of the reclining buddha and you know all these types of buddhas yeah well, here's the famous japanese smirking buddha <laughs> i you know i just have i do things to crack myself up you know this is uh one miserable son of a bitch <laughs> <laughs> and this guy's saying, I should think so. <laughs> this guy, he's not so sure. <laughs> and here's a, a Mohawk businessman in blue. <laughs> this one here has a long title. I'm sorry, sir. We cannot honor a policy that ran out the day before your horrific, horrific accident. <laughs> so that, that's, that's your insurance guy telling you how it is. <laughs> Did any of your drawings make uh, any of the uh, Frank Zappa covers? No, but I have a bunch of uh, uh, pictures of Frank Zappa that I've drawn. And I, use, I sell them at, uh, you know, in Europe. Most of them are over in Europe right now, but uh, yeah, you know, I've just made little characters, some back in the seventies, you know, Beefheart got me into the art thing. And I, I just started carrying around sketchbooks and doing that. And uh, yeah. And now that Frank's dead, you know, um, those are very popular compared to my stuff, which is, you know, either abstract or some funny caricature. I read some article about you recently that was about, uh, uh, how, how you probably have like six different bands, guys, books, all memorized, you know, from yeah. McLaughlin to this guy to Schofield to, you know, and so when they call you out to go on the road, there's no rehearsals, usually no time for that. Just like, okay, I'll switch trains into Schofield's book and, and play with him, you know, and I just wonder how you visualize or imagine the music you hear. Well, you know, it's sort of, this, I, you know, I guess it's, it's, it's sort of the same thing as like, like, uh, like Lenny White or Buddy Rich, who are not readers. And, you know, music to me is like having conversations. I mean, it's like, for instance, you know, like how many times you, you had a conversation with somebody and you haven't saw, you haven't seen them in 20 years or 10 years, 20, 10, 20 years and five years, five, 10, 20 years, 30 years. And you see them for the first time and your mind immediately go right back to the last time you saw them, the conversation you had. Yeah. Music like yeah. that. It's like that with me. Yeah. Well, say and, something as complex as McLaughlin, though. You know, I mean, that's some tricky stuff, man. And, and uh, you know, I mean, uh, to me, I have to count and I have to, you know, sectionalize and structuralize it. Uh, yeah, so I just wonder. I did the same thing. 
you know, at first, but once I played it and understood it, then it's in there. Yeah. So it's like, if I get called to do the tour again and we play those pieces again, it's there. Yeah. It's like recall. Yeah. Because I played it. Yeah. I played it. That's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing and it can be a curse. (laughs) Well, you know, I mean, it's not like it's not a curse for me, (laughs) even with my little framework, you know, it's a curse (laughs) to learn hard stuff. I mean, when those guys, when McLaughlin and uh, and, uh, Billy Cobham came out, man, it was like, dang, you know, I can't even count this. And and they opened all of our eyes, you know, and, uh, you know, five of the greatest guys who ever played together in the perfect thing you know on on many many levels you know because yeah. Cobham's not just a chops freak man he's superhuman you know and I don't think that's left him much I don't think anybody's come close to that but then there's the odd time things there's the Latin things there's all the Tony influence there's I've seen him sit down on a pearl kit you know a right-handed pearl kit and he's playing left-handed and swing his ass off man yeah. and you'd never know that this guy had those chops until they exchange fours. Then yeah. you go, oh my God, you know, then it's Billy Cobham on a tiny little kit. And yeah. you hope that he doesn't break it <laughs> so that the guy's kid he's sitting in on, you know, but I mean, so much. And he could read, he could compose, yeah. you know, uh, he, he's really a super extension of, of what the possibilities of a drummer are. And I mean, maybe that can't, you know, you can see where, um, Louis Belson, that was very important to him to be a composer and a writer and, you know, all around musician, read this, everything. And, um, you know, then uh, Tony's always been like a super compositional guy. You know, he even went back to school, you know, which I don't think he had to do, but he yeah. did, you know. And uh, and then, you know, this amazing uh, drumming, you know, and amazing creativity. Uh, yeah, I mean, those guys... Uh, I really admire, you know, and I, I've worked a lot on composition. I try and write because of those guys, you know, like Louis always said, you know, learn, learn the piano, you know, so you can understand blah, blah, blah. And I don't, I don't play the piano much, but theoretically I can understand that. And I've written a lot. So at least I've made some use of my time here in, uh, in Japan and, and I've released a couple of records. Of all the great work you've both done, is there a favorite, uh, gig or night that is just especially memorable to either of you? Well, for me, <laughs> talking about Tony, there was that uh, night where, uh, you know, I had a standing rule in missing persons. I was never to know if anybody famous was in the audience because I didn't want to be nervous and choke, you know? So we went out, it was a night in San Francisco and, uh, you know, I, I played really good and uh, the U.S. drag came and I did a drum solo in U.S. drag over the, over the time. And, uh, you know, it was everything I wanted to do. And I come off stage and Warren goes, uh, oh man, Terry, you sounded great tonight, man, you're solo in U.S. drag. He goes, guess what? I said, what? And he goes, Tony Williams was here. <laughs> and if I would have known that, man, I would have sounded like, you know, a three-year-old tripping over the drum set, you know, on his way to try and get on the stool. You would sound like the Warner Brothers frog. Yeah, exactly. Man. It was just Ribbit. the worst. <laughs> yeah. Just like, you know, you're your mind says, do this. And your body goes, (laughs) (laughs) not there for you. Not listening. Hey, wake up. (laughs) You you got a big enough kit now, no matter where the above, that something's going to happen. That's Dennis, you have a a favorite or a a most memorable tour gig in particular. Yeah. I, uh, well, I got a few of them, but you know, playing with McLaughlin, that was all those gigs were 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 great. Especially especially the nights when John would actually say we we were playing for the gods, which mean like you know, no matter what happened, you know, like it just came on right. Everything was just perfect. Yeah, and we we had a bunch. Of, well, we had a few of those nights, you know, where you just I mean, you try to make things wrong, and it just still came out right. Yeah. Other things was like when when George Clinton, the Parliament Funkadelic, when he came out of, out of the uh, mothership naked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think I'll 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 always remember that. You 
And the CO2 come off. Yeah, all that the band smoke. Comes off. And then the smoke clear. And there he is with a white wig with just nothing, just standing there. Like standing there like Superman, you know, with nothing on. Like, oh my God, we're going to hell. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> Man, when I saw him come out on, uh, well, he always had a lot of different ways he would look, you know, it was almost like different every night, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, he came out in the combat zone uh, when, when the Zappa band was watching him, and he looked like the Maharishi. <laughs> he had like some dreadlock haircut. And then just a white robe or something, you know, tied around. And, and, and it's like, wow, is that is that him? Yeah, that's him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so nice. So you did, we're, we're just waiting to see what happens. One of my favorite bands was uh, uh, with Holdsworth and Levin and Pat Mastelotto. You know, we had no music. Every night we would just go out there and start. And I love everything those guys play so much. There's nothing they could play that would make me go, oh, we should have written something. You know, it's just like, oh, man, this is so cool. And I'll do this with them. And, you know, it's like I, I, I wouldn't even warm up, man. I could I could like hang out until the last minute and go on stage. Normally, you know, I'm like, OK, I got to have an hour to focus on what I'm going to do, my material or whatever. But with th these guys, it was like there's just no way you can fall off the log. You know, it's it's just happening. So. I had one experience like that with a band called Graffiti. And that was just unbelievable, I thought, you know, for us to get together and everybody's sort of on the same wavelength. Mm. And you hit and it was just phenomenal. Yeah. And yeah. I was dying to to do something like that again. Yeah. yeah Instead me of doing too, all that, that rehearsing and you know, everything's gotta be, you know, kind of structured, you know. Mm -hmm. You already somewhat prepared when you walked in the room yeah instead of like just walk in and don't know what you're going to do and just try to you know create some music yeah. gotta ask this question before we wind up uh of both of you and dennis you know young kids out there we were talking a little earlier about chops and going a little bit over the top on that as they're you know in their formative years not that everybody doesn't kind of get that out of their system hopefully at one point but when it comes to feel and groove, I recently interviewed Mick Fleetwood and I said, you know, you're, you have such a pocket, did that come naturally? And I was quite surprised where it was, the answer was the opposite. It was something he really worked on. Uh, any suggestions you have for guys out there who are, you know, looking to, to get that end of their playing together? Something that seems like it came so natural for you because everything you play just feels so good. Well, you know what, I, I, I don't think it's, well, for me, you know, I, I had to work at it just like everybody else. But, you know, you know, it all started with the, the era, the, the time I came around, uh, the time I first started listening to music and what I was listening to, which is totally different than what's going on now. You know, music was just, I mean, you know, you think about the 60s and the 70s, you know, all through the 70s, it was just a beautiful time period for music. And everybody was pretty much experimenting with with different things and you know different you know um, different concepts and 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 uh, different ideas of how you know how they put bands together, structures of how they put the band together. And also, it, you know, it was blasphemous to like try to play like somebody else, you know, in the seventies, sixties, and seventies. And that's why, you know, back in those days, uh, I, I hate to sound old or anything, but. Back in those days, you know, you can you you can't even count on your hands how many bands that were you know that were out there and they all sounded different. Let's take Motown for instance. You know, you take that you know that one unit or company, and then you know like how many groups that came through there. You had the Temptations, you had the you had the Four Tops, you had the Supremes, you had the Jacksons, you had Stevie Wonder, you had Marvin Gaye, you had the Marvin Letts, and 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 you know like uh, Dennis Coffey, uh, you know all these people none of them sounded alike. Yeah. And yet they used the same rhythm section, <laughs> you know, and then, you know, you take the stacks recording, the same thing there, you know, it's like you had all these artists and they used the same rhythm section and none of them sounded alike. Mm -hmm. And the reason that was because nobody wanted to sound alike. And then you had record companies back then also 
it's like the the more different you sound, you know, the better chance for you to get a record deal because they were willing to take a chance. Now, uh, since the 80s, you know, late 80s up until now, you can't get a record deal unless you sound like somebody else. And that's why when you turn on the radio, I, I can't for me, I can't stand listening to the radio because it sounds like everybody sounds the same. Whoever had the hit record out, you better believe in, the, in like within four months, here come another group that sounds just like the guy who put out the hit. And don't let him, you know, be lucky and do, you know, a few hits. Then you then you have a format Then you know, set up a format or a cookie cutting tool for everybody else to follow that. Uh, man, it's crazy now. So it is for me. It's, it's like, been... man, like, don't don't give up. Don't you know, don't give up your dream. Don't give up your your ideas. You know, um, I strongly suggest, you know, for everybody to like just play what they 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 feel in here. You know, try to be themselves. Not don't try to be like somebody else. That's what make yeah. you. That's what make you unique. That's what make a musician musician. You know the reason why you love Herbie. The reason why you love Tony, Billy, or Terry. Uh, you know everybody is because they play what they feel. They play what they hear. You know based on you know whether if they're playing structured music or not. Think of missing person, missing persons. I mean, it couldn't be more unique. <laughs> yeah. yeah individuality is is really something to strive for you know yeah. uh, i've always said like when when uh when jazz was the music right 60s 50s what have you it was really from the big band era all the way up um one no two notes right the uh of <laughs> of uh of one or the you know the uh of four and the uh of uh of two you know those two little ding, 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 that, th that, those two notes in a measure are what defined a guy. And you could go, well, that's, you know, that's yeah. Grady Tate or that's, uh, you know, Elvin Jones or, yeah. you know, that's Tony Williams because it's more like an eighth note. And, uh, you know, uh, so two notes in a measure would yeah. define a drummer's sound and personality, you know? So it's, it's not. I, uh, I call it DNA. It yeah. The DNA. Yeah. Yeah. An important part of pocket, I think, is note placement, right? So you know, it's like you're not. It, you're somehow you're keeping the time, but when you want to play the first sixteenth note after the beat three, it's so on, you know, and and leaving that space, you know, like like a percussionist, like timbali players, you know, like they play. Uh, perfect note placement, you know, in order to keep that groove happening, you know, and uh, I just love that part about, uh, you know, Walter Rodriguez and Alex Acuna, they, they just never play wrong. They're always, yeah. you know, they play off the beat all over the place. Right. Uh, and, but, but it's always right on off the beat, you yeah, know, yeah. <laughs> just beautiful. Yeah. I thank you both. Uh, this has yeah. been a fantastic opportunity. You guys will go on all night here, but we're going yeah. to have to wrap it up. Uh, Dennis, we'll keep in touch for sure. Terry, I know I'm going to be talking with you over the weekend. I love you both. Thank you yeah. so much. And I, I really feel uh, more life is inside me from just this conversation. So thanks. Love you guys. You too. Love me you too. back, Terry. And yeah. safe travels, man. Yes. You too. Both of you. Absolutely. And we'll talk to you real soon. Thanks so much. Okay. Right. Have a good night. <laughs>